Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'd like to say that it has been a privilege for me to be among you for these three weeks, this part of your larger series on discerning our welcome at College Mennonite. And I'd like to ask if you would, uh, if you would pray with me, please. Lord God, we thank you for your callings and your graces toward us. We again confess our need for direction and for wisdom from you to know how to proceed, to know best how to be a church together as we consider the gays, lesbians, LGBTs among us. We ask for your blessing on our discernment and gathering this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Two weeks ago, we looked at some key biblical passages that are not often considered when thinking about LGBT issues, but which I think are important for framing the discussion. We noted that several biblical passages clearly condemn what looks like same-sex activity, but those passages all seem to address homosexual acts as an expression of sexual excess rather than sex within the context of a limited loving relationship. So lest I be misunderstood on this matter, I would like to say clearly that I agree with all seven of the classic passages on this topic. When sex is an expression of sexual lust, it is wrong. It can even be evil. But, as I have also been saying, when sex is an expression of love within an exclusive monogamous relationship, I think it has the blessing of God just as much as sex between a husband and wife. I also suggested that we can and should take the Bible more seriously in our moral discernment, even though the route that we take between what the Bible says and how we live it out in our daily lives is not always as linear or as clear as we wish it might be. The Bible is not an answer book, nor is it an answering machine that always plays the same tape regardless of our question or the context in which we ask it. Nevertheless, if we are not informed by the stories and teachings of the Bible on a regular basis, we risk founding our worldview on trends in society, which is not good. Furthermore, studying the Bible together is one of the activities that the Holy Spirit regularly uses to speak to God's people. Don't you want to be there when that happens? Last week, I addressed 10 questions that you had for me, questions that I thought had good potential for clarifying how we should approach the Bible. My own conviction is that thinking about homosexuality as an abstract comment, uh, concept will never get us where we need to be, regardless of how brilliant we are, how well we know Greek and Hebrew, or how sophisticated we are in theology and ethics. I am not an anti-intellectual. I think these are wonderful gifts that the church can and should seek out. My point is that nothing substitutes for getting to know gays, lesbians, bisexuals, trans transgendered folk, queers, intersex people, and asexual people as people as friends. So if you want to be taken seriously in addressing this issue, your credibility will depend on, in part on what relationships you have. This week I want to do three things. First I want to touch on chapters 5 and 6 in that book, Human Sexuality in Biblical Perspective, a study guide. Those chapters are entitled Moral Challenges for the Church and Moral Choices for Believers. Second, I want to address two comments from last week. And third, I want to risk offering you some practical suggestions for finding a way forward as a congregation. And since I do not know this congregation well, I fully expect that you will need to weigh the appropriateness of those suggestions for your own context. Moral challenges for the church. So what are our moral obligations to one another given the conflicted understandings of human sexuality that exist today in the broader society, in the church, in the Mennonite church specifically, and even within this congregation? It is natural for people to want to relate with like-minded people. That is why some conservatives are withdrawing from the church today to find more compatible networks. And the same thing happens with people on the affirming side. 
Last week, I suggested that one problem with this reality is that when it comes to being the church, it's not ultimately about you. In fact, it's not even ultimately about what you believe and what you don't believe, let alone what you feel comfortable with. It's about the fact that Jesus died to save humanity, and it's that death that is fundamental for our unity as a church, not our theological agreement. So our first moral obligation is to thank God for the grace and love that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. And our second moral obligation is to thank God for the gifts of the brothers and sisters that God has given us in the church, regardless of whether those brothers and sisters think like we do. Another way of thinking about the moral obligation that entails from our approach to scripture in these weeks is that our obligation is to be welcoming. In the book, Carrie and Gerald say, the theology of scripture outlined in our approach to a variety of biblical texts in both the Old Testament and the New Testament demonstrate a way of being biblical and moral discernment that paves the way for the full inclusion of persons who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, questioning, or asexual in Christian congregations, including the blessing of same-sex marriages including also the licensing and ordination of LGBTs as appropriate in light of their gifts and callings with the expectation that those persons exhibit the same sexual fidelity and holiness that we expect of heterosexual persons. So if welcome is an appropriate and welcome watchword, what does it mean? It means that like the formerly forbidden eunuchs and immigrants who are welcomed to the assembly of the Lord in Isaiah 56, LGBTQIA believers are now full participants in the life of this church that is on the way. Welcome means embracing, not just tolerating. We talked last week about the complicated relationship between the Bible and culture as sources of wisdom. I suggested that we should always be both critical of culture and also open to it, even open to learning from it. One way that we should be critical of it is in recognizing that our culture tends to privilege certain versions of heterosexuality. If you are white, Protestant, heterosexual, and generally happy with the patriarchal outlook on life, you probably feel generally comfortable in this culture. When we apply to this cultural reality a sense of should, a sense of oughtness, that this is the way things should be, we have what is called heteronormativity, the expectation that sexual intimacy must conform to society's idealized version of heterosexual couples and their families. Although Jesus was known for his scandalous love for those in the margins, most Christians today simply find reasonable and acceptable those sexual expressions that somehow make sense in their cultural context. In our consideration of moral obligations, therefore, we must learn to be more critical of heteronormativity that our cultural takes for granted. There are several moral problems with heteronormativity. One is that it ignores the diversity of sexual relationships witnessed to in the Bible. Another is that both the Gospels and the Pauline literature focus more on the character of relationships than they do on the form of those relationships. You already know that sex between a married husband and wife is not necessarily moral or right, not if it is an expression of violence or control. Marriage itself does not and cannot automatically sanctify violent sex. It is not that the character of a relationship is all that matters. Rather, it is best when character and form cohere. Sexual violence and sexual misconduct in the church are terrible. They are an affront to the Holy Spirit and should be a terrible embarrassment to the church. We can and must do better, especially within a marriage love and respect are required. As our stories untold and the SNAP network have reminded us, we have a lot to answer for in the church, even in the Mennonite church. Although we hate to admit it, our heteronormativity and our patriarchy have given an unspoken license to abuse women and children. Those who hold positions of authority in the church have been able to protect themselves from accountability through the manipulation of power in some cases. 
The stories are heartbreaking. And of course we want to be redemptive. But in the name of being redemptive, we have as a church failed to hold certain men accountable and worse, we have perpetuated the conditions under which some women continue to be abused. We have unwittingly perpetuated the violence associated with the abuse of power. The biggest mistake that AMBS made with John Howard Yoder in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s was that we took John Howard Yoder more seriously than we did the women he assaulted. As a church, we will not be healthy until we are able to notice, honor, and care for those with the least cultural power. Whether that refers to a gay man, a transgendered teenager, a child, or a woman in an abusive relationship. The least of these, as Jesus says in Matthew 25. The less respectable or seemingly inferior members, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. Might it be true that in this congregation some members matter more than others? If so, you want, might want to reconsider 1 Corinthians 1, 28 and 29. Brothers and sisters, this is a major moral obligation. We must say no to sexual violence and sexual misconduct and have the courage to live accordingly. So what moral cho choices do believers have? As Carrie and Gerald Mast indicate, Giving and receiving counsel in the church is a significant moral choice. It's not just a matter of listening to what the church says, but being part of the discernment process, wrestling together with others about what the Bible is saying. A second moral choice that we face is the choice of keeping covenant. Covenant loyalty is a big issue in the biblical story of God and God's people. Covenants refer to any agreement implicit or explicit, between people or between people and God. It's a major theme in Ruth that we heard this morning. Covenant loyalty, chesed in the Hebrew, is one of the three big virtues in the Old Testament, right up there with hope, faith, and love in the New Testament. The covenants in view here include our covenant commitments to God through baptism, the covenant we made with our spouse in marriage, if we're married, and the covenants we have with our faith community through membership and communion. According to Carrie and Gerald Mass, the most important of all these is our baptismal vow. Do our actions expressing love and intimacy with another person contribute to the resurrection life into which we have been raised in baptism? For example, are our expression of love and in, uh, expressions of love and intimacy consistent with the reconciling and peacemaking life of a disciple of Jesus? Is the expression of intimacy honest in what it says about our intentions and commitments? Thus, one of the moral obligations implied by sexual intimacy is the obligation to ask ourselves whether we are able to offer the care and fidelity of covenant that is suggested by sexual intimacy. And does that sexual intimacy betray or support the spirit of the marriage covenant, which requires two people to be exclusive as, we, as well as to feel cared for within the relationship? This is important because covenanted sex cannot be casual sex. As I la mentioned last week, my own journey on this issue is one marked by changing my mind. When I was a seminary, uh, in seminary as a 20-something pastor, I had worked out and could defend a theology, an ethic, and a, an ecclesiology that supported the requirement that gays and lesbians be celibate. In time, that changed. Later, once I was clearly affirming in my own views, I remained critical of congregations that felt the need to officially and publicly become a welcoming congregation and join the Supporting Communities Network. Why was I critical? There were two reasons. One, because the Mennonite Church as a whole was unhappy about this move. It unnecessarily caused trouble, I thought. I thought becoming publicly welcoming was adopting an act-up posture that needlessly politicized an issue that was better approached in other ways. When I was an unofficial faculty rep to the Gay and Lesbian Support Group at Bluffton University, I had several long conversations with the president, Lee Snyder. She was afraid that the group wanted to act up, 
and politicize the issue. She knew how damaging this could be to the institution. We did, in fact, want to educate the community about LGBTs, but weren't really interested in acting up. Uh, we had really good conversations, and a breakthrough came one day when she asked quite directly, what is it exactly that you want? I said, we want the university to go on record that gay bashing and word or deed will not be tolerated. She answered, oh, is that all? Well, we can do that. And so they did. I remain ambivalent about power politics in the church. Power politics is the air that we breathe in the larger society, but giving and receiving counsel is a precious commitment in the body of believers. It's a commitment and an obligation to protect and contribute to that process, even though it's not easy. The shared commitment to seeking the mind of Christ as a body of believers is ever so more important than winning an argument. The second reason I was critical of becoming a publicly welcoming congregation was my thought that politicizing the issue was not essential to the more important task, which was that of being a genuinely welcoming congregation and getting the word out about that without sending out a news release. In other words, I thought that both congregations and the gays and lesbians themselves had more to gain from keeping under the radar. I've changed my mind about this. Why? Because I've learned that a congregation is never truly welcoming until it says publicly that it is welcoming. Because a congregation that wants to stay under the radar with regard to those outside of the congregation can never truly be open, available, and welcoming to those who are among the most vulnerable, those without political power in the system. Sometimes one simply needs to do what is right. One simply needs to take the risky and bold path rather than spend too much time calculating the consequences. The same holds true for individuals, churches, seminaries, and conferences. You are not safe, and you cannot be safe, unless and until you hear yourself affirming to others that you are. You might still not be safe after that, but at least the public affirmation that you want to be safe and are safe is a prerequisite to being so. Now I want to respond to two comments from last week. Several of you hinted that maybe you could tolerate gays and lesbians among you as long as they didn't marry. Uh, a few months back, I'm talking to one man, not from this congregation, uh, about this issue. He recently said that he could maybe go along with gays and lesbians being members of the church, maybe even if they were in a committed relationship, and maybe even with a stretch, marrying them in the church, but he could not support their being ordained or taking a ministerial leadership role in the congregation. That was going too far. I don't want to argue this point at length, but I want to be clear about what I think and why. The central ethical issue here is whether God blesses same-sex relationships. If not, we should not be welcoming either, unless the welcome is to repentance. But if God truly blesses same-sex relationships, and if we then want to bar them from marriage or from church leadership, then we become the problem, not them. It is, frankly, a terrible responsibility to speak for God, and some people do it far too often, too easily, and too lightly. But Jesus essentially says that we speak for God when we engage in a congregational discernment process. Just check out Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Another person commented that we should not judge others in the church, but that is simply not biblical. On the contrary, if we want to be, truly be a part of the Church of Christ, we must judge in the Church. I would go so far to say that if you are unwilling to judge in the Church, you cannot be the Church of Jesus Christ. First, and this, I know this sounds crazy, like judging in the Church? Lauren is actually advocating that. I am. 1 Corinthians 5, the whole chapter, is pretty clear on this issue. Now, we should not be judgmental. When Jesus says, judge not, in Matthew 7, 1, 
He was addressing hypocritical judgmentalism, not all judging or discernment as such. He was saying that we should not judge hypocritically. Yes, we need to be humble and self-aware. And surely there are people who need to learn that message. But we cannot avoid throwing pearls before swine or giving what is holy to the dogs unless we judge at some level, Matthew 7, 6. We cannot beware of false prophets unless we judge at some level, Matthew 7, 15. We cannot know them by their fruits unless we judge at some level, Matthew 7, 16. If another member of the church sins against you, Jesus says, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone, Matthew 18:15. And you can't do that unless you judge at some level. The point is, look in the mirror first. And if there happens to be a two-by-four hanging out of your eye, you maybe shouldn't be too concerned about that speck in your brother's or sister's eye. On the other hand, if you don't care at all about helping your neighbor with that speck in his eye, it just shows that you don't care. So it would be disastrous if you gave up on judging in the church. Just do it fairly, honestly, generously, and with appropriate vulnerability. Should this congregation decide to go on record as a welcoming, affirming congregation that truly welcomes LGBTQIAs and expects the same sexual purity of the minority community as it does of the majority community, you will need to work out more of what this will mean in practical terms. I've decided to risk offering some practical suggestions and will ask you to critique them and add to them in the small group discussion. The first suggestion is don't speak louder than the ones with whom you disagree. I don't mean this in only a literal way, I mean, don't engage in a win-lose argument. Don't compete. Now, I actually believe in argument. As I said last week, I think constructive argument might actually be worth trying sometime in the church, but not in the sense of competition or as debate. Number two, recognize that there are and will continue to be differences of opinion and perspective in this congregation. Don't expect those with a minority opinion to get over it. Also, I hope you don't study this issue for the next 10 years or bring it up all the time. We have lived with disagreement in the church for 2,000 years, and the LGBT issue need not change that. Number three, be respectful toward those with whom you disagree, whether in their presence or not in their presence. At minimum, this means not talking about the others behind their back. It also means that when we discuss this issue, we just should assume two things. One, we should assume that there are gays and lesbians and perhaps a BTQI or A in the group, and or that those in the group have family members who are LGBTQIA. That need not make us speechless but it should make us cautious and respectful in what we say. Number four, ask those who cannot in good faith bless same-sex relationships to join the rest of the congregation in making this a welcoming place. This is hard, and it's probably the hardest one in in the list here. This does not mean that the minority needs to agree that God blesses same-sex relationships if the majority does. However, it does mean not trying to convince others that they are wrong, whether we're talking about the LGBT community itself or their allies. Certainly, it means that you as a congregation will need to ask the non-affirming among you not to express judgmental or condemning thoughts. Why? Because unless those who are not affirming agree not to sabotage the welcome of this congregation, This congregation will not thrive, nor will your welcome. Let me give you an example. Ten years ago, Mark Souter sent around a terrible survey about immigration. I don't know if any of you remember this. In response to this, the congregation that I was attending, 8th Street Mennonite, did our own little survey within the congregation. The results were mostly encouraging. 75% 
Two-thirds of the congregation were in favor of 8th Street advocating for those in our area who are undocumented. However, five people or so agreed or strongly agreed that they would consider it a personal responsibility to report any unknown undocumented immigrants to the authorities. Now think about the implications of this slide. As a result, our undocumented immigrant neighbors, such as those at Iglesia del Buen Pastor, rightly concluded that 8th Street was not a safe place for undocumented immigrants 10 years ago, despite the fact that the strong majority of people at 8th Street, five out of six, felt that it should be. Though this is important, you should garner the support of those who are not themselves welcoming. Number five. Ask LGBT allies not to try to convince the non-affirming minority to change their mind. I see this as a matter of respect. When one Mennonite congregation in London, Ontario was on the verge of deciding to join the SCN network, those in the congregation who were not affirming said that they would agree to the public affirmation of being a welcoming congregation on one condition. And that was that the majority would not try to convert the minority and they agreed and became a welcoming congregation. Number six, all believers, whether straight or gay, whether affirming or not affirming, should be free to say what they believe and why they believe it if and when they are asked. Number seven, avoid triumphalism. This is so important. I've known congregations that struggled for so long on the LGBT issue that when the affirming group started to get the upper hand, they started to think that they were getting the upper hand. That is, they celebrated their triumph as if it were a win, which implies that the other side lost. Although this kind of attitude is natural, the problem is that it is natural. It is fleshly. This kind of a win is a true loss. This is a spiritual matter. I truly believe that triumphalism is an evil spirit that can take over a congregation. And you will need to be diligent, intentional, vigilant about naming it and calling it out when you encounter it. Eight, expect the pastors and the congregation as a whole to continue to affirm godly sexual ethics, which includes expecting fidelity in marriage, sex within committed relationships, and the treatment of the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. You were bought with a price, so respect the fact that you belong to God and glorify God by taking care of your body. I myself felt convicted about this issue just this week as I was studying 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 with my class at seminary. The point here is that we are not, at least we should not be, beyond the time when we need to dis disciple each other in the church. Some worry that if we accept gays and lesbians in the church, then what is next? We accept everything. No, I've never, been found, I've never found the slippery slope argument compelling. People who have worried about change have been using the slippery slope argument for a long time without much real benefit. It's hard enough for the church to consider well a well-defined theological or ethical issue without also bringing in a boatload of other issues that are unidentified and unarticulated, nor should we. We simply do not have enough wisdom on this side of eternity. Nine, change the script. One person commented that Mennonites don't deal very, with conflict very well. Well, that may indeed be true, I'm embarrassed to say that I had already pastored for several years before I learned in seminary what it means to be passive aggressive. Then I had to admit that not only had I been passive aggressive, I'd actually enjoyed being passive aggressive. Worse yet, I realize now that I had asked others to celebrate my brilliant passive aggression without putting it in so many words. Lord, have mercy on me. One Lutheran educator by the name of Pat Kiefert, who served as a consultant several times for different Mennonite groups, 
once commented that for all of our pacifism, Mennonites are among the meanest people he'd ever met. <laughs> Whether that is true or fair, brothers and sisters, passive aggression is not our calling. Nor is it being mean. Let's change the script. Let's build instead a reputation for being honest, fair, appropriately vulnerable, generous, straightforward in our speech, and committed to making peace, even on the local level. James 3.18 says, those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. That's the Common English Bible. And if you look at your peace candle reflections, I think you'll see that the quotation by Robert McAfee Brown was a, a kind of paraphrase of James 3.18. Now I'd like to do small group work. So as before, I'd like you to find a couple of other people, get in groups of three, and I would like you to consider these suggestions in, in your small group. And we have paper. Uh, some of you have paper already. Uh, if you don't, um, uh, it'll, it'll be coming around. This time, instead of writing questions and comments for my benefit, I'm asking that you would write questions and comments for the pastoral staff and other leaders at College Mennonite. I asked uh, Phil for permission to do this. Please assemble in small groups of two or three to discuss just this one question, which has three parts. What can you affirm? What can you not? And what other practical suggestions would you offer? And here I'm, I'm asking you to respond particularly to those nine suggestions. And if you would like a, a bonus one, a tenth one, it is that it would be good to bathe all of these nine in prayer uh, as a congregation. So, what do you affirm, what do you not affirm, and what other commitments should we consider? Go to it. <laughs> 